All right, the book of Jonah. Start off at the end of chapter 1. I'm going to go into chapter 2. And a little bit I'll jump over to Hebrews 12. I'm going to combine sort of two texts here tonight. But Hebrews, or excuse me, Hebrews. For now, Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Chapter 2 describes for us those three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou, her, uh, and thou heardest my voice. For thou had cast me into the deep, in the midst of the sea, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed, round about, uh, closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we certainly do love you. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, I thank you for it, for giving us this amazing book to help us in life, to teach us of you. And Lord, tonight, I pray that you help me to stay true to it. Lord, I pray that you'd guide what I say and how I say it. Use it to strengthen us and to draw us closer to you. Lord, to change us. Lord, that this would not just be another service, but that we'd understand that we're getting ready to hear from your word. So, Lord, please work on hearts. I do pray if there's anyone here who has never truly been converted, I do pray for that conviction and that drawing, that perhaps even this evening they would repent and place their faith in Christ. Lord, I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes it can be very hard to imagine how serious trials can be a help to us an advantage to us, where there's ways that God can actually use them and times that God chooses to do just that. And sometimes, especially in the middle of it, can be really hard to see. Again, I, I, I think back to one of the more difficult times in PNG, and there were several of those from the, the first time arriving, but uh, one, one of the more challenging times after I was there, of course, I've mentioned before, was when Daniel left for college. And it just seemed the Lord allowed everything, it, in my mind anyhow, it wasn't a reality, but sometimes when you're in the middle of it, it just seems your world's falling apart, even though it's not. But when you're in the middle of it, that's how you perceive it. Daniel had left, and the, so the first child was gone of the five, and I, I, that hit me harder than I ever thought that it would. And, um, and then I get back from dropping him off at the airport, Marianne flew back with him, um, and then I found out the next day we had a major sin issue with the guy I was, I was training to be pastor of the work in Kudu Kudu. He had disqualified himself. Um, another sin issue popped up. Um, this is all in the same day, different events coming. I found out I was losing about, this is a couple weeks later, not that same week. I found out the house we had been in, the Lord had provided, we had to move out of, we had to lose it. Remember, there's no house, I'm in New Guinea, there's no market there on the island. Um, 
we, I found that the work was struggling greatly, both of them, the work in Kudu Kudu, the work in, in Sohom. That was depressing as a missionary to see that taking place. Uh, um, and it was just a miserable, difficult time. But also when I look at that time, I, I certainly realized, uh, again, the strength that I thought I had, I did not have. The dependence upon God that I thought I had, I did not have. That there were things that needed to change. <clears throat> I certainly saw how much closer I needed to be to the Lord. And sometimes when you're going through a deep trial, a hurt, you begin to realize, I have got to get closer to the Lord. Jonah, of course, is under a measure of chastisement from God. He is God's prophet. He is running from God. And even in chastisement, that is all of God's grace and mercy. Now let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm not going to read all this for time's sake. It's already 22, and there's just a really good points that I want to get to tonight to try and be a help. It says in verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So the exhortation starting off this portion of this chapter is telling you, listen, don't get mad when God decides to chastise you. This is, this is, this is actually a good thing. He is doing it because he loves you. In other words, he's not doing it because he's angry, although he might be angry. But that's not what's motivating it. What's motivating his chastisement on your life is the fact that he loves you. What's motivating is the fact that he knows you're on a wrong direction. So there are times he will inflict a measure of pain for very good reason. Let's jump down to Hebrews chapter 12. As you know, it goes on to say, if you don't have God's chastisement, you're simply not saved. You're not his. Look at verse 10. For they ver verily for a few days... Uh, uh, chastened us after their own pleasure, our earthly fathers. But he, get this, this is God, for our profit, that we might partake of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. I mean, when you're in the middle of God chastening you, or in the middle of a trial, regardless of chastising, obviously you don't think it's a time to be joyous, but he's reminding you. Let the Lord use it. This is what he says. He says he understands it's but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Those who are put through it. As we're going to see today, in other words... When we look at Jonah, what took place in chapter 2, there are advantages to being in the well's belly. There's advantages when the God in your life had to prepare, when God in your life had to prepare a well for you to get your attention. Where he allowed something to swallow you up that your soul was being crushed. That he prepared something for your life. We have to understand there are advantages in those moments. I want you to think about this. If, if any of us were to find out, we get the call from the doctor, and you find out you've got two months left. Let's just suppose for a minute that hits. The doctor shows you this is what's going on, and he tells you, you have two months in 60 days, you will die. 
Do you know what that's going to do for you immediately? It's going to put things in focus like that. You're going to know what's important in life immediately. You're not going to need a lesson on it. You're not going to need pastoral counsel on it. You're going to know what's important. The frivolous things that were bothering you are gone. They don't bother you anymore. Because a, that trial has put things into focus in a second. It brings you to your senses. You can think clearly. There are times in life that God has to force the issue. And this one I'm dealing with, especially with chastisement. To prepare that well, if you were, to prepare that well, if you will, that great fish sort of to swallow you up. Again, it's not always we can go to different chapters in the Word of God for this from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's, it's not always due to chastisement. But there are times that he puts us in a place to face the consequences of our own actions. But whenever he does it, he does it because he loves you. I am so glad that God up in heaven doesn't do it. He says, you know what? You simply deserve this. How many times do we do that with our own children? With God, that's never why. He has a passion, even though we don't, he has a passion for our holiness. Even though that's something, we live in a culture today that is just the opposite of that. And yet, it doesn't change the fact that God has a passion for our holiness. And he loves us too much at times to let it continue. So it's in this that we can see some of the great benefits of being in the belly of the whale. It's not about just punishment to make one suffer and God getting enjoyment from it. It's because God loves us and because what it can yield in your life. That's why even when you're chasing in your own children, this isn't a lesson to parents, but if you would have the same principle in mind, that when it is time to chasten your own children, that it's not about afflicting pain because they deserve punishment for a sinful action. It's about trying to motivate a change in behavior that your end of them is out of love, that you want to see them on a right road. See, that's what will help you do it right and not out of anger. That's what will help you that when you're done with them to give them a hug and say, listen, I love you. Let's pray. So let's look at some advantages to being in the belly of the whale. Back in Jonah chapter 2. We can, I want to pull a couple of principles out here, out of this chapter, that we see happen to Jonah, who was a very rebellious prophet, directly going against God's will for his life. But the first thing that we see here in verse 1 and 2, Jonah has now been swallowed up. I'll cover in a minute what he's going through. But it says this, right after he gets swallowed by that well, then Jonah prayed. Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. That says a lot right there. It says a lot about the humility of Jonah, about how he was approaching God. He wasn't coming to God blaming God. He wasn't coming to God, God, you put me in this. This is Jonah. The first point is this, taking responsibility for his actions. Many times to take, 
How often do we excuse our sin? How often do we do the same thing that Adam and Eve did in the garden? It's always somebody else's fault. You will cripple your life spiritually until you take accountability and responsibility for your sin. Husbands, it's not your wife's fault. Wives, it's not your husband's fault. Take personal accountability when it comes to sin. He didn't blame the storm. He didn't blame the, sail- the, 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 the other uh, sailors that threw him overboard. He didn't blame the whale. He knew this is my doing. This is what I get. He understood looking at all the events, the storm, the casting of lots, the raging sea, the fact that a fish, a great fish, a whale has just swallowed him up. He's understanding how God's in control of all of this. I'm here because you put me here. Him taking responsibility is the very first step to him getting right with God. Because until you take the responsibility, repentance will never take place. The first opportunity at it again, it will happen again and again and again. So God used that will to get Jonah finally to take responsibility. Number two. We're going to see in verse three through six, he he, he agonized. Wow, that's a good word. I just made that up. Completely left off the R right there. That is impressive. He recognized the error of his way. So that's another way the Lord uh, uses the whale in our life. Look at, let's read three through six here. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. It's through this experience he's describing that he gets to the point, I will do it. I will do what I have said. But I just want you to see what he describes. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption. O Lord my God. You see a man that, through what he is going through as a result for being in the belly of the whale, he has recognized the error of his way. Sometimes it takes being in the belly of a whale before you see clearly your wrong direction in life. Jonah saw it. When God's call came in chapter 1, of course, he ran from the presence of the Lord, not even recognizing his idolatry was his own nationalism. That he would put his nation before the call and command of God. When God's call came, he ran from the presence of the Lord, it told us. Now he finds himself in a place cast out, as he said, of God's sight. But remember, this is what he wanted. This is what he thought he wanted. But now that he's there, oh no, it is so miserable. He was so wrong. He goes, I, there's, he's like, what was I thinking? This is what I wanted? So often of what we think only leads to pain and hurt in the end. Much like the children of Israel in the wilderness when they grew tired of manna. And God gave them the request, if you remember, and set leanness unto their soul. I mean, I think of Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. As soon as Jonah was actually cast out by God and he recognized it, he desired to be right back. 
aren't you good too? I'm going to get to this later, but the Lord's mercy and grace. The Lord doesn't say, no, this is what you wanted. This is where you are. No. The Lord's mercy was right there. His grace was right there still. Because his chastisement is based on his love. And think of how, what he is describing here, how terrifying this is, how terrifying this must have been. I mean, being swallowed up by this creature would be pitch black. Just the, the, the smell, the stench would be so horrible. You can hardly move. You don't know which way's up. You don't know which way's down. There is no light. I, I, you can think of the other, other uh, creatures that he has swallowed. Uh, um, they're going through a digestion process. I, it would just be so nasty. The acid that would be around you. The fish, the, the great whale, no doubt, constantly swimming. Is he talking about it? Diving down, feeling that what, what is taking place. The salt water continually washing over him back and forth, entangled in the sweet seaweed, wrapped around his head. His body would be burning. I mean, basically, the Lord is putting him in hell. It's sad that too often it takes speed in the belly of the whale to get our attention. Lot realized that when his wife perished. Next thing we see is that Lot remembered. Look at verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. And make no mistake, all these events were taking place instantly. Even though it was over three days, three nights when this took place, this, this is him recognizing instantly what has taken place and where he is and what's, what's happened to him. He remembered the Lord. He remembered his God. His soul overwhelmed and realizing, what have I done? Here I am, his soul being crushed. It's not so much the physical pain that, that he even described that. That would be taking place. But it was what was taking place on his soul. The crushing realization of him running from God, of desiring this. Sad, again, it takes too often the belly of a whale for us to remember God. And I fear, unless the Lord returns, that's exactly what is coming for our nation, that we will remember God. This whale has done its job. Now Jonah is turning back to God. He sings out in prayer, I remember the Lord. He's dying, he's in pain. His soul is overwhelmed. Not just with death, but with his disobedience, with where he was at, with what led him there, with what got him to this place. As we know by his prayer at the very end of the same chapter. I think I know what he remembered about the Lord because remember he talks about looking unto God's holy temple in this prayer. You know what I think he remembered? Of course, the Lord brings to mind God's mercy and grace. I remember, actually, that was part of his problem with Nineveh, was God's mercy and grace. Because he didn't want him to save Nineveh. And so now God has him in a place. Jonah, guess what you need? My mercy and my grace. I believe he remembered God's amazing mercy. I think he remembered how much God loved him, God's call on his life. I think he remembered how God is taking care of him and has shown such even mercy in his life up to the point leading to that call. Because clearly things were off already. I 
I think he remembered that God is near to those who are in trouble. I think he thought, uh, I, I mean, we have, we have the great, great chapter of like Psalm 103, I believe, those principles of God coming to his mind. And God has his attention. Remember this, God will do whatever it takes to bring us to the place where we remember him. He does that because he loves you. Now, verse 8. This one, oh, don't miss this truth here. He gives out in the middle of this. Basically, this is Jonah's sermon to everybody else that tries to follow his path. Just a few simple words. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. He's shown us the truth that he learned. He's shown us what he realized. We saw what he, what he just remembered. Now he's a truth that he is realizing. What a great verse. Sometimes the greatest truths that we learn from God come from the whale's belly. The word observe in this verse means to pursue, to pay attention to, to court, to be diligent with. This is dealing with those who pursue things, those that seek things, that give their diligence to, that give their attention to, that in those things in the end that are nothing but vanity, they lie to you. That's where Jonah was, and he now knew it. That he was given his heart, his attention, his diligence to lying vanities. The things that he thought there was purpose in, but there wasn't. Because what happened? He's, he's at the point of death. He's realizing everything's coming to focus in his life because of the situation he's in. And he's realizing, what have I done? I have given my life, my diligence, my heart to lying vanities. Things that in the end don't matter. How often do we give our time and attention to things that don't really matter? This is really anything apart from the pursuit of God. Let me quote from commentator Barnes on this one. He said this, All have this common principle of vanity. That people look... Let me start this again. All have this common principle of vanity that people look out of God to that which is, has its only existence or permanence from God. It is then one general maxim including all people's idols of the flesh, idols of intellect, idols of ambition, idols of pride, idols of self, idols of self-will, that people observe them as gods. They watch them. They hang on to them. They never lose sight of them. They guard them. But what are they? Lying vanities, breath and wind, which none can grasp or detain, vanishing like air into air. He's so right. We give our attention or time to our pride, our self-will. It's lying vanities. I wonder how many of us right now are pursuing lying vanities. Pursuing things that are empty. Things that have deceived your heart. He, he, he said, doing so, you're forsaking your own mercy. And really, we see this from Psalm chapter 59, verse 10, verse 17. I'm not going to turn there for time's sake. It's, it's, already, it's just past 8 o'clock. Where the, both those verses state that God is my mercy. Now, it, there's, a, there's an application of it with Jonah forgetting all about mercy, of course. And Jonah's going to have more problems. We're not going to go through the book, of course, but he's going to have more problems later on. And we can deal with our own sinful nature. It's, a, it's amazing how times we get out of the belly of the well, and some of those old tendencies tend to come right back. But this is dealing with turning and forsaking God because of lying vanities. To quote from another, he said this, 
Jonah does not in this exclude himself. His own idol had been his false love for his country, that he would not have his people go into captivity when God would. Would not have Nineveh preserved the enemy of his country? And by leaving his office, he left his God. He forsook his own mercy. Not trusting the sovereignty of God to do what he needed to do with his own nation. Which then led to, let me cover this last one very quickly here, repentance. We see that 9 and 10. I will sacrifice unto thee the vow of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation as to the Lord. And we know the Lord spits him up, uh, or the, the whale spits him up, vomits him up right on dry land. He agrees to follow. He agrees to fulfill his calling. I will do it, Lord. I will do what you have called me to do. As we see, there are some lessons in this. All of it leading to that place of repentance. We can see how God can use those times to get us, if, when sin is involved, to get us to see our own responsibility, the error of our way, to bring us to a point of remembering God, of realizing the vanity of anything apart from God. And remember when Paul found out in 2 Corinthians and that the thorn of the flesh, that he sought God thrice to take it away, and God would not. And, of course, when, when he heard from the Lord, my, Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness, my grace is sufficient for thee. Paul put a law together that due to the abundance of revelation given unto him, that he's a man, that pride could overtake him in this. And the truth hit him that, wait, God is using this to remind me how frail I am. That all this, the intellect that I have, the the, the, the knowledge that has been given to me of my understanding of Scripture actually has nothing to do with me. It's simply God. And then that's when he started praying, Lord, then don't take it away. Keep it. You see, what he realized was the advantage of that trial in relation to God. We really do see in this the sovereignty of God. I want to read a a, a message, a a guy who preached on this text in the 4th century. Um, it, It really is pretty impressive. Chris Austin, he considered one of the church fathers, he's from Antioch, the same Antioch that Paul uh, was in at, at the church at Antioch there, when we get into that in Acts chapter 13. Remember, that church became key from that point on. I dealt with that when we went through it in the book of Acts. We're going to get more into that church and its role in play in the, in the King James Version of the Bible and the Byzantine Manuscripts when we get to that. It has a key role as well. So I want you to think of the context when he was preaching this message. Uh, before he was pastoring, he was in Antioch, and riots had increased when Constantinople had raised taxes in Antioch. The pastor of the church at that time rushed to beg for mercy because Constantinople had set down soldiers, and they were starting to wipe out the town. So the pastor of the church there heads there saying to, to try and plead to get him to stop. Well, while he was gone, this is when Chrysostom took over. He began preaching. And the Lord actually blessed his preaching. Actually, I do love it because he's known for it. He started preaching through the books of the Bible. It flourished. He would eventually become the pastor of the church until he actually gets kidnapped and basically forced to be pastor in Constantinople. I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> Bob does, but. (laughs) So, he was preaching on this topic, Jonah, when he went through Jonah. Listen to this. Guy writing this in the fourth century. He fled the land and fled not the displeasure of God. He fled the land and brought a tempest on the sea. Not only himself gained no good from flight, but brought into extreme peril those who took him on board. 
When he sailed, seated in a vessel with sailors and pilot and all the tackling, he was in the most extreme peril. When sunk in the sea, the sin punished and laid aside, he entered that vast vessel, the fish's bell, that thou mayest learn that as no ship availeth to one living in sin. So when freed from sin, neither, get, get the point he's making here, neither sea destroyeth, nor beast consume. The waves received him and choked him not. The vast fish received him and destroyed him not. But both the huge animal and the clement gave back their deposit safe to God. By all things, the prophet learned to be mild and tender, not to be more cruel than the untaught mariners or wild waves or animals. For the sailors did not give up at first, but after manifold constraint in the sea and the wild animal guarded with him much benevolence, God disposing all these things, he returned then, preached, threatened, persuaded, saved, awed, amended, established through, through that one first preaching. For he needed not many days nor continuous exhortation, but speaking these words, he brought all unto repentance. Wherefore God did not lead him straight from the vessel to the city, but the sailors gave him over to the sea, the sea to the fish, the fish to God, God to the Ninevites, and through this long circuit brought back the fugitive, that he might instruct all that it is impossible to escape the hands of God. For come where a man may, dragging sin after him, he will undergo countless troubles. Though man be not there, nature itself on all sides will oppose him with great vehemence. Some tremendous truth in there. Talking of the balance between God's chastisement and God's mercy. All that in play here. How the waves did not drown him when they should have. How he should have died the moment he went in the belly of the well. But God didn't allow it. For one, his point was he knew Jonah and that moment would look back to God and remember his Lord and beg unto God and tell him, I will pay that which I have vowed. I have been wrong. Even when it looks hopeless or impossible, God can deliver us. We see God in control and caring even for the disobedient prophet. And doing what is necessary to get his attention. The sailors did not try to kill him but help him. Incredible. Again the waves not drowning him is just amazing. The whale not killing him is incredible. All this God is in control. Just like when that famine hit the prodigal. In the parable. That sore trial. That place of just nothingness got him to think again of the Father. He finally came to himself. There are advantages to being in the belly of a well. But our hope and our prayer is that God does not have to send that fish to get our attention that we would just be exhorted by the hearing of his word and saying, Lord, thank you for your mercy. I am yours. With heads bowed and eyes closed.